A very good afternoon to all of you. It's an immense pleasure to welcome you all in this international webinar, jointly organized by the Department of History, Sheba Bharati Mahavidyalaya, Kapgadi Jhargram, and Tourism and Travel Department, Ramakrishna Mission Vidyamandir, Belurmat, Howrah. First, my humble pranams to Swami Ekochitta Nandaji Maharaj, Principal Ramakrishna Mission Vidyamandir, Belurmat. Then to Swami Mahapragya Nandaji Maharaj, Vice Principal, Ramakrishna Mission Vidyamandir, Belurmat. I also pay my sincere regards to Dr. Debok Prashad Shahu, Principal, Sheba Bharati Mahavidyalaya, Kapgadi, Jhargram. I also pay my gratitude to Dr. Binod Choudhury, Vice Principal, Sheba Bharati Mahavidyalaya, Kapgadi, Jhargram and to Mr. Prahulad Adok, HOD Department of History, Sheba Bharati Mahavidyalaya, Kapgadi Jhargram for their sincere support and help in organizing this international webinar. As per the schedule, we will begin this webinar with the Vedic chanting. Now it's over to Vedic chanting. Om. Se Guru Pyo Namaha Hare Om Sahana Sahana Unatu Sahaviriam Paravai De Jasme Navahe Tamastuma Vedaveshavahe <laughs> Namo Brahmane, Namaste Vayu, Vameva Pratyaksham Brahmasi, Vameva Pratyaksham Brahma Vadishyami, Rudam Vadishyami, Satyam Vadishyami, Tanmam Abadu, Taravattaram Abadu, Avadumam, Avatu Bhaktaram Om Shanti 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 Hare Om Bhadram Karne Vishrunaya Madeva Bhadram Vashye Maksha Virya Jatra Sirai Rangaye Stushtuvahum Sastanuri Yashema Deva Hitayadayu Swastina Indro Brutasrava Swastina Usha Vishwameha Swastina Starksho Arishane Vihi Swastino Bruhas Pater Dadu Hare Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachyate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Shishyate Om Shanti 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 Hare Om Tatsat Shri Rama Krishna Ramanamastu. 
Thank you for the Vedic chanting. Now I welcome Dr. Devaprasad Shahu, Principal, Shiva Bharati Mahavidyalay, Kapgari Jhargram, to give the welcome address. It's over to you, sir. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, you are audible. Onkon Babu, I am I audible? Yes, sir, you are audible. Please start. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Sir, you are audible, sir. You are audible, sir. You can start. Onkon Babu. Yes. You can start. You, you okay, can okay. Start. Thank you. Okay, okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Myself, Dr. Devaprasad Sahu. Principal of Seva Bharati Mohabiddaloy. I think somehow he is disconnected. Okay. Yeah. I also think so. Due to network issues. Yeah. And to the international webinar on connecting history, heritage, culture, and tourism way to an inclusive growth, which is organized by Department of History, Sevavarati Mohavidyalay, and Department of Tourism and Travel, Ramkrishna Mission, Belur Mot, Howrah, West Bengal, India. Sevavarati Mohavidyalay was established on 17 July 1964 by Dr. P. K. Sen, an eminent educationist who was Sir, your mic is mute, sir. Sir, please. Sir, please unmute your mic, sir. Now audible? Now yeah, it is audible. Yeah, Perfect. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes, yes. Was established on 17 July 1964 by Dr. P. K. Sen, an eminent educationist who was promoted by the urgent necessity of providing the young minds of the remote poor village and its adjacent areas with quality higher education. The name Seva Bharati suggests that the ideal Indian can only be constituted on the noble principle of Seva or service. The word Bharati is also highly significant. One meaning of Bharati is speech, another is learning. The college is dedicated to this noble service since its establishment and it has completed its 50 years of glorious service to the nation. The motto of the college is Taposha, Seva and Pragoti, which means the development of either the nation or the individual is a progressive concept. I extend my heartily thanks to Dr. Gautam Mukhopadhyay, convener of this international webinar and course coordinator, Department of Tourism and Travel, faculty member, Department of History, Ramakrishna Mission, Vidya Mandir, Belur Mot, Ongkon Purkait, convener of this international webinar and assistant professor. Department of Department of History, Seva Bharati Mohavidyalay. I warmly welcome Maharaj Sami Pragyananando, Vice Principal, Ramakrishna Mission, Vidmandir, and Sami Ekachitanando, Principal, 
Ramakrishna Mission Vidya Mandir to this webinar and convey my thanks for giving us time and sharing your knowledge and expertise with the students of our college. I also heartily and warmly welcome all the speakers of this national international level webinar. I am sure that this international webinar is going to be a vibrant and fruitful platform for academic discussion. With the participants from various colleges, universities and academic institutions. Finally, I extend my genuine sense of appreciation to the members of organizing committee, technical assistants and other members of this two days international webinar. Last but not the least, this international webinar is for the academic development of the student community, which suffer a lot during this COVID-19 pandemic situation. I wholeheartedly welcome all the students to participate in this international webinar to make it a fruitful and memorable one. I wish you grand success to this webinar. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Over to Ankur, sir. Thank you, sir, for the welcome address. Now I request Srimad Shami Ekuchitta Nandaji Maharaj, Principal Ramakrishna Mission Vidyamandir Belur Mat, under whose guidance this college has recently been accredited with A++ grade. Now it's over to you, Maharaj, to give the inaugural address. Om Sahana Vavatu Sahana Humunaktu Sahavir Yankarava Bahai Tejaswina Badhi Tamas Tuma Vidvisha Bahai Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Respected Professor Deva Prashad Shahu Principal Shiva Bharati Mohavitarai respected Dr. Shomir Kumar Maiti, IQVC coordinator of the same college, who are the uh, joint host of this uh, August uh, program webinar. Beloved and respected Mahapragyananda Ji, respected Professor Gautam Mukhavadhyay, Sri Ankan Purkait, other distinguished speakers will be joining us soon after this inaugural session and my beloved students. Uh, on behalf of Ramakrishna Mission Vidya Mandir and Vidya Mandir uh, Travel and Tourism Department, or the Tourism and Travel Department, I extend you a most hearty welcome to this international webinar, two-day international webinar. So the Department of Tourism and travel since its inception has traversed a long way and it has contributed a lot towards the quality enhancement of this college. They have already organized a number of workshops and seminars and the students who opted for uh, this particular diploma course, diploma in tourism and travel they have also been uh, placed in their uh, own capacity. So the sojourn was uh, going in full flow till uh, uh, Corona came to stop our advancement. And we do pray and hope that today's, I mean rather two days uh, webinar on connecting history, heritage, culture and tourism will again be an important step towards achievement of our coveted goal. Swamiji sets the goal to be reaching the perfection. Anyway, in this uh, uh, juncture, I gratefully remember the name of revered Swami Shastragyananda Ji Maharaj, who was the architect uh, of this particular course, course in Diploma in Tourism and Travel. And I acknowledge my heartfelt respect and gratitude to Professor Gautam Mukhavadhyay and all his associates who have toiled hard to make this webinar 
success. Actually, in this Ramakrishna fold, Ramakrishna Parivar, uh, tourism and travel definitely attains a different dimension, a significance in another way, non-conventional way, given the fact that Swamiji himself, who was a Swami Vivekananda, none other than the visionary behind Ramakrishna Mission Vidyamandir, and all his Guru Bhai's brother disciples, they had a particular inclination for a tra travel, I shouldn't say tourism, but we see that in mendicants' life, they have traversed all over the uh, country, and wherever they have gone, they have tried to acquire some speciality, some expertise they have tried to acquire. And they have tried to translate it in the mission setup, Ramakrishna mission setup. Uh, that's what exactly we find in the beautiful architectural blending in the uh, Sri Mandir of Sri Ramakrishna temple inside Belurvat. Swami so tried to synthesize uh, the architectural beauty that he could conceive, he could perceive during the mendicant's life. So, in that context, Ramakrishna Mission Vidya Mandira set up, we have got another uh, important dimension of the particular course. And I once again pray for uh, the total success of this two day webinar. Once again, I extend a most hearty welcome to all the participants who have joined us over this um, uh, two day webinar over YouTube or some other uh, Facebook, whatever is available. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om. Thank you, Maharaj. Now I request Srimad Shami Mahaprogyanandaji Maharaj, Vice Principal Ramakrishna Mission Vidyamandir, Belurmat, to give the introductory remarks. It's over to you, Maharaj. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope I am audible. Okay. Yes, you are audible, Maharaj. Yes. Yes. Om Namo Bhagavate Sri Ramakrishna. First of all, I would like to extend my heartfelt congratulations and best wishes to the conveners of this program. Especially the credit goes to Professor Gautam Mukhopadhyay, who is the coordinator of this travel and tourism course and also one of the distinguished faculty members of the Department of History in Ramakrishna Mission Vidyamande and the authority and all other associates and principal sir in particular, Dr. Devi Prashad Sahu, Seva Bharati Mahavidyalaya and all other faculty members of the Department of History of that same college for initiating this wonderful two-day international webinar regarding the travel and tourism. Our scripture proclaims Charai Veti, Charai Veti. In our life itself, we all are sajarna. It's a way unending. As a person, we all are approaching towards the desired goal. Our scripture says that in that sense, almost all the Indian philosophical school, they consider any human being as a sajarna, ultimately approaching towards the goal of life, what we call Mukti. Now, as Principal Marat rightly indicated that, especially uh, maybe in the life of a monastic member or 
a lay devotee or a common person, everyone, this traveling has a lot of impact. And uh, of course, it is sure that since last one and a half years, this travel and tourism industry, just like uh, many other industries, got badly affected because of this COVID pandemic. And regarding the course, I can say that uh, Vidya Mandir initiated a lot of this uh, job oriented programs and courses. And this travel and tourism is one of the leading courses in that list. So uh, this is very wonderful initiative and very nice approach. And I think now itself when the, this COVID pandemic is by the grace of God is uh, gradually perhaps subsiding. Now arranging such webinar and uh, uh, you know discussing the different aspects of this travel and tourism is very apt and almost uh, it's, it's a need of the hour itself now. So once again, I do congratulate the conveners and associates of our travel and tourism department, Ramakrishna from Vidya Mandira, and the uh, uh, Department of History uh, of uh, Seva Bharati Mahavidyalaya. And uh, I pray to the Holy Trio for a grand success of this international webinar. Once again, we will thank you. Thank you, thank you Maharaj. Now I request. Uh, Sri Gautam Mukhopadhyay, Coordinator, Tourism and Travel Department, and also Faculty Member, Department of History, Ramakrishna Mission Vidyamandir Belurmat, to give, to present the theme of this two-day international webinar. It's over to you, sir. Thank you, thank you, Professor Ankur Purkai. Divya Swami Ekochitananda Ji Maharaj, Principal Ramakrishna Mission Vidya Mandira, Swami Mahabhrugananda Ji Maharaj, Vice Principal Ramakrishna Mission Vidya Mandira, Dr. Devaprasad Shahu, Principal Sheva Bharati Mahavidyala, Dr. Shomit Kumar Maiti, Coordinator IQAC Sheva Bharati Mahavidyala, Distinguished Speakers and Guests, My Dear Students and All Viewers. Here we have virtually assembled today to attend a two-day international webinar on connecting history, heritage, culture and tourism way to an inclusive growth jointly organized by the Department of Tourism and Travel Ramakrishna Mission Vidyavandira and the Department of History Sheva Bharati Mahavidyalaya. For centuries, History, culture, heritage, and cultural heritage have represented more a source of inspiration for writers, poets, or historians, or rather a curiosity for those who have had the opportunity to come in contact with it. Only in the first half of the 20th century, with the adoption in 1931 of the Athens Charter for the restoration of historic monuments, concern for the fate of the cultural heritage received an institutional and international dimension with an almost exclusive attention given to the restoration and preservation of the historical heritage. The Venice Charter for the Conservation and Restoration of Monuments and Sites, issued in 1964, has reconfirmed the concern for the preservation and restoration of the historical heritage. But it was the UNESCO Convention concerning the protection of the world cultural and natural heritage, 1972 that define comprehensively the cultural heritage as including monuments, architectural works, works for monumental sculpture, painting, elements or structures of an archaeological, 
nature, inscriptions, cave dwelling, and combinations of features which are of outstanding universal value from the point of view of history, art, or science. Groups of buildings, groups of separate or connected buildings, which because of their architecture, their homogeneity, or their place in the landscape are of outstanding universal value from the point of view of history, art, or science, and sites, work of man or the combined works of nature and man, and areas including archaeological sites, which are of outstanding universal value from the historical, aesthetic, ethnological, and anthropological point of view. Three decades later, in 2003, UNESCO has brought to the light and recognized the value and importance of the intangible components of the cultural heritage, issuing the Convention for the Safeguarding of the Intangible Cultural Heritage, where this part of the cultural heritage, uh, rather ignored until then, has been defined as including the practices, representations, expressions, knowledge, skills, as well as instruments, objects, artifacts, and cultural, cultural spaces associated therewith that communities, groups, and in some cases, individuals recognize as part of their cultural heritage. This heritage, transmitted from generation to generation, constantly recreated by communities and groups in response to their environment, interaction with nature and history, providing a sense of identity and continuity, is manifested in the domains of, firstly, oral traditions and expressions including language as a vehicle of the intangible cultural heritage, secondly, performing arts, thirdly, social practices, rituals and festive events, fourthly, knowledge and practices concerning nature and the universe, and fifthly, traditional craftsmanship. While UNESCO visions regarding the tangible and intangible cultural heritage inspire strong technical, content-oriented, and exhaustive features, the definition given to the cultural heritage by the ICOMOS International Cultural Tourism Committee in 2002 focuses more on the experiences its future discovers and discoverers and explorers may enjoy. What are these expressions of the ways of living developed by the community and passed on from generation to generation? including customs, practices, places, objects, artistic expressions, and values. Cultural heritage takes the forms of tangible or intangible heritage, but these two terms, tangible and intangible, are very closely related, overlapped, and because of that are not very well divided. Both definitions specify that growth should benefit, quote-unquote, all segments of the population, unquote, and be distributed, quote, fairly across society to people, across the labor market spectrum, unquote, in, quote, different parts of the country, unquote. There is a clear requirement that the benefits of growth are both social and economic in nature, and for this growth to be sustainable, not only economically and socially, but also environmentally. However, the RSA definition focuses on those most directly affected by the activity, both geographically and as a result of their relationship to and ownership of it. In the context of heritage, there is a greater focus 
on the inclusion of communities which are closest to their heritage, whether physically or culturally, and recognizing the value that heritage brings to society for economic growth. Now, I would like to focus on some economic terms and concepts. Economic growth can be demonstrated by measures of production such as gross domestic product or GDP or gross value added GVA, but this recorded growth often has little or no benefit to marginalized and disadvantaged groups. This can lead to levels of poverty that remain high or grow even through production increases. Similarly, there are questions about the role of international development in bringing real growth to all levels of society and whether current models of development are benefiting those most in need. There can sometimes be a focus on economic growth at the expense of social inclusion and engagement. Rising inequality negatively affects international development as it can lead to economic in insecurity and dampened growth, social problems including well-being and unrest and political instability, making countries more equal can be seen to boost poverty reduction, poverty reduction efforts as head of research for the World Bank, Martin Revelian undertook 900 household consumption surveys in 125 developing countries to determine whether growth decreases poverty or not. He found that a 1% increase in income can cut poverty by 4.3% in more equal countries compared to only cutting poverty by 0.6% in the most unequal ones. In the outcomes of the G20 St. Petersburg Summit in 2013, aides of governments and states recognized that too many of our citizens have yet to participate in the economic global recovery that is underway. The G20 must strive not only for strong, sustainable and balanced growth, but also for a more inclusive pattern of growth that will better mobilize the talent of our populations. There is a need for economic growth to be distributed more fairly across all levels of society and to work in an inclusive way, building on the strengths of people and places to promote sustainable development. Inclusive growth can help achieve a fairer distribution of wealth. It encourages more engagement and participation of communities and a deeper understanding and appreciation of the value of peoples and places for the mutual reinforcement of economic growth and social welfare. Now, I would like to come back again to history, culture, and heritage. Cultural heritage, both tangible and intangible, can cover many areas from the built environment through uh, to cultural traditions such as music, language, etc. The understanding of heritage is dynamic in nature, being constantly interpreted and changed depending on the passage of time, the change of context and the public's experiences and expectations. Heritage does not belong to any given group, but it is open. It belongs to all those who wish to identify with it. And moreover, all of these could be interpreted and revised as well as redefined in terms of necessity or demand of contemporary situation. And tourism, one of the largest service industries of the world, relatively had a direct role to play when it comes to COVID-19, whose worldwide spread has brought the world economies 
into a sudden halt. It has a wide impact not only on the tourism sector but also on all people across the society irrespective of their professions. Since travel has become an important part of everyone's life and is no longer considered as a luxury but a necessity to escape from a uh, routine life and to rejuvenate himself, we are positive that travel will revive soon. And since time immemorial, the human desire to travel and explore is universal, which will positively turn the wheel for everyone to enjoy vacations. So two must of the main social and economic benefits that tourism brings be available to everyone. The recovery might be slow, but we are sure once we manage to control this pandemic, the tourism and travel industry will be the first one to see the major leap. But with new dimensions, perspective, attitude, goals, scope, and above all with new challenges. But especially inbound tourism may face serious crises as travel restrictions will follow. We have to remember that in this situation, we need to think about an all-inclusive growth to give support to the people and stakeholders of all sectors. And in this context, our history, culture, and heritage can give us this scope for an inclusive growth. And finally, even WTO announces that as tourism grows further, the industry will reap benefits that will be felt at various sectors, felt at every sectors and subsectors of our broad and diverse industry, from the biggest airline to the smallest family business, which I have already mentioned in my concept note. The need of the day is to further conserve, the, uh, conserve and preserve our history and heritage for the growth, of, uh, growth and development of industry. And this webinar will seek to analyze various aspects and survey and measure all the possibilities related to the role of history, heritage, culture, and tourism in the near future to create various scopes for people from all sectors of the economy in this new scenario. And I personally convey my gratitude to all speakers and resource persons of this two-day webinar and I convey my deep respect, especially to Professor Shankar Kumar Mukherjee for his continuous support. And also I convey my love to Professor Onkon Purkai, who is also one of the conveners of this webinar. And finally, I would like to thank you all. Namaskar. Thank you, sir, Thank you, for sir, introducing for the, the theme of theme this of international, international webinar. webinar. Now, I now I request, request uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Shomit Dr. Kumar Maithi, HOD, Department, HOD of Department of English and IQSC coordinator, coordinator Shiva Bharati Mahavidyalaya Jhargram to give the vote of thanks vote for of this thanks for inaugural this session. Inaugural it's session. over to it's you, Dr. Maithi. Thank you, Ankur Babu. Am I audible? Yes sir, you are audible. Yes sir, you are audible. Good afternoon everybody. Uh, myself, Dr. Swamit Kumar Maithi, Assistant Professor and Head, Department of English, Seba Bharati Mohabit Daloy, and also the IQSC Coordinator of Seba Bharati Mohabit uh, I feel immensely delighted to be the part of this international webinar. And I feel privileged and honored to get the opportunity to propose a formal vote of thanks on this occasion of international webinar on connecting history, heritage, culture and history, sorry, culture and tourism way to an inclusive growth jointly organized by Department of History, Seva Bharati Mohabit Daloy, and Department of Tourism and Travel, Ram Krishna Mission Vidya Mandir, Belur Mot, Howrah. Um, I take this opportunity to extend my sincere thanks 
and hearty congratulations to Dr. Devo Prashad Sahu, Principal, Seva Bharati Mohabit Daloy, for encouraging the conveners and the organizers to uh, organize this kind of international webinar uh, during this pandemic situation. I also extend my sincere thanks and gratitude to Swami Ekochitananda, Principal, Ramakrishna Mission Vidyamandir, and Swami Mohaprabhgananda, Vice Principal, Ramakrishna Mission Vidyamandir, for gracing the inaugural session of this webinar and for uh, encouraging words. My sincere thanks goes to the conveners of this webinar. Mr. Gautam Mukhopadhyay, Course Coordinator, Department of Tourism and Travel, Faculty Member, Department of History, Ram Krishna Mission, Vidya Mondi. And he has remarkably uh, highlighted the major theme or the focal area of the webinar. And my sincere thanks also goes to Mr. Onkon Purkai, Department of History, Seva Bharati for organ uh, for uh, taking initiatives to organizing this kind of uh, webinar, which is highly relevant, particular uh, particularly in this situation when there has been a resurgence of cultural conflicts, uh, violence, sectarianism, and various forms of uh, violences and terrorism in the present world. And I think uh, history, study of the history, culture, heritage, tourism, this has its tremendous significance in, uh, in, in developing a sympathetic attitude towards the other culture, towards the other nation. And tourism, as uh, the convener has rightly pointed out, has its remarkable importance in our life. It is not only uh, and, uh, it is not only a means of luxury, but it is a necessity, uh, uh, sir, sir has rightly pointed out. Now, I wish a grand success of this webinar, and I also extend my uh, heartfelt gratitude to the honorable resource persons who have kindly given their consent to deliver their invaluable speech in this webinar. And I wish a grand success of this webinar. Thank you, sir. With this, we come to an end to our inaugural session. And now we will move to our first academic session. Our first speaker is Professor Shankar Mukherjee. Shankar Mukherjee is an assistant professor in the Department of Tourism and Travel in Amity University, Kolkata. He is a young scholar and he pursued his MPhil from Jadavpur University, Kolkata. And he was also associated with various schools, colleges and universities of Kolkata and out of state. Now it's over to you, Sir Dr. Shankar Kumar Mukherjee. Sir, uh, please yeah. unmute your mic, sir. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's okay. Namaskar to all of you. I hope that I am audible. Absolutely, yeah. sir. Fine. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to speak in this esteemed platform with all those esteemed guests. Yes, truly speaking, that tourism itself is now a necessity. It is not at all a leisure now. So being a part and parcel of the tourism industry as an academician, I really take pride that uh, tourism as a subject, it is something that is doing good to the society. So absolutely, I agree with the speaker, uh, my previous friend who said that tourism today is a necessity. It is a necessity. So I will be presenting a small uh, presentation here on Marble Palace 
which is uh, one of the best, which could have been one of the best destinations of visit in Kolkata. Uh, many of us know, but for the young generation, so what I do find that many of the young generation, they are not aware about uh, Marvel Palace. So I have decided to give a small lecture on Marvel Palace. I'm sharing my screen. Is my screen shared? No, we are not having the screen. Okay. And I would like to request our host to see the matter. I think Mr. Ramakrishna Mundal. I think the screen is visible now. Perhaps it is going to be visible. Okay. But till now, it's not visible. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. Carry on, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, this is our incredible India. Uh, yes, we are fortunate to be born in India and absolutely India is one of the incredible countries of the world and this is uh, the Marvel Palace of which I am going to speak today. Uh, the topic. Sir, can you please uh, make it full screen? Yeah, I have made it full screen. From my end, it is full screen. But we are not getting the full screen view. Is it? Right. Probably it will come later. Okay, okay. please get there. Okay, so uh, my topic today is conserving and preserving the Babu culture of Kolkata, the study on the Marvel Palace on tourism perspective. Kolkata is the city of palaces. This is what tourism professionals fondly talk about. But to all of us, it is the city of joy. But no, it is not a city of joy. It is a city of palaces. It is known as the city of palaces because of the number of buildings built by the British Raj during the 19th century. Kolkata, previously known as Calcutta, was declared as the capital of the British India during the 18th century by the Governor General Warren Hastings. Kolkata became the hub of the Britishers and the city grew in terms of architecture. Sir, uh, sorry to interrupt you. Very sorry to yes. interrupt you. Due to internet disturbance, uh, perhaps uh, the slide is not changing. It is static. We are seeing the first uh, slide, with the, the picture okay. of Vidya Mandira and your title. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. It, it is, it is, it is here. Okay, it's fine, but it's not yet a uh, full screen. No, I have, as it is going, when I'm making it full screen, I think the slide is not changing. So should okay, I? Okay, okay. Okay, okay, carry on. Do it from the yellow, niche je bar kor ta ache, ota di ek bar chesta korun, ta hole hoy to hote pare. Okay, okay. Not sure. Now is it full screen? Is it full screen? No, 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 no. It's not full screen. Okay. But Keep it as it is now. Okay. Okay. So the Kolkata, previously known as Calcutta, was declared as the capital of British India during the 18th century by the Governor General Warren Hastings. Kolkata became the hub of the Britishers. And the city grew in terms of architecture because most of the trade and commerce, the business activities, it used to happen through Kolkata and the Kolkata port. The buildings built by that time had Roman, Gothic and even Mughal influences to some extent. Now let us talk something about the Bengal culture 
the culture which we the bengalis really take pride of and we have contributed a lot in the culture of the nation but what is the exact origin of the word bangla the exact origin of the word bangla or bengal is unknown mostly unknown though it is believed to be derived from the dravidian speaking tribe bong that settled in the area around 1000 bc the mahabharata mentions a kingdom called bongo other historians believe that the word bonga might have originated from the austric word bongo which means sun god the history of bengali culture dates back to 1000 bc the bengali language shares a rich literary heritage with its neighboring country bangladesh there is one country in africa where bengali is one of the official languages yes you have heard it right there is so one country in africa where bengali is one of the official language and the name of the country is sierra leone bengal is famous for its traditional folk songs baul songs bhatiyali gaan and its iconic chhou dance it has a tradition of folk drama commonly known as jatra and we the bengalis are very much fond of spending our evening enjoying a jatra or a play or a natak the bengali cuisine is world famous nowadays even if you go to new york you will get one bengali restaurant the staple food of bengal remains boiled rice and various items of fish and sweets the festivals of bengal make it more attractive and colorful durga puja remains pioneer of the festivals of bengal local festivals include gajon gombira which is in the malda district and urush now uh, my uh, major thrust area of today's discussion will be the babu culture of kolkata even today uh, when the bengalis are been called as even i am mostly called by shankar babu now what about this babu is babu my title no i guess not but the bengalis have a way of communicating when we say shankar babu bono bihari babu so babus were the new urban group of high class people they are flamboyant bengali gentlemen who came into being as a result of close interaction with the britishers as i have told that uh, kolkata became the capital city of india and the most of the events most of the administrative part the business part the hub remains kolkata which gave an immense opportunity for the bengali people to do business yes it is a fact that once upon a time we the bengalis were really very good businessmen and how we used to do the business in today's short lecture i am going to tell you about one bengali being a businessman what he did in his life so they came in close interaction with the britishers in the late 18th and the 19th century they were very rich and they have challenged the social norms of the colonial kolkata because they were rich so whatever the social norms it has challenged now uh, some examples what the babus used to do in those days babus showed off their wealth with extravagant festivals and hobbies like buying zebras to pull carriages through the street of kolkata there is an iconic picture where you will find that in the roadway of kolkata a zebra driven car is been pulled they also built palaces that followed the architectural design of the famous houses in london like windsor castle the royal albert hall we are 
flamboyant people those, those days we used to have competition of kite flying competition with pigeon fight etc and where wealth was shown to the common people ramtanu dotto the son of a successful businessman and probably one of the most exuberant babus of the time had his house cleaned twice a day with pure rose water i repeat his house gets cleaned twice a day with pure rose water that came from the up city of mirzapur another babu bhuvan mohan niyogi of bag bazar was said to light his cigars with burning bank notes now about some other happening at the beginning of the 19th century though the time of the babu started to fade revolutionary movements were flourishing in kolkata causing the british to take away its status as a capital city yes the british has faced a lot of pain for running kolkata as a capital city so they decided that it's time now to move the city from kolkata to new delhi trade was differently impacted the mansions deteriorated as newer generations struggled to upkeep up with their astronomical costs so before 1911 the last 50 60 years we can consider it as a year of the babu culture okay i hope you might have all seen the iconic movie of shotojit ray about jalshaghar so from there i can actually recapitulate what ray said in his movie was totally and absolutely correct now uh, after this period post 1911 the world went into the first world war and the glamour of these people they started to fade today most of these houses are crumbling the state government has done very little to help playing the role of a silent spectator because there are so many legal issues involved with this house until and unless the legal issues are completely dissolved nothing can be done it has to be mentioned that the whole world is fighting to save their own heritage we must be the only city in the world not putting any positive effort to save the city's culture but this is half correct actually uh, if we consider about the babu culture about the private buildings yet it is correct but those buildings which are in the hand of the government or archaeological survey of india or with the tourism department something good is happening the babus were the high class rich bengali people during the late 18th and 19th century who came into being as a result of intimate interaction with the british in kolkata to sum up in a word the babus of kolkata showed a magical era of wealth grandeur and extravagance which gradually faded out with the century the babus of kolkata originally expresses the culture of bengali so if you want to have a peep into the culture of the bengalis so you can go through the lifestyle of the babus from there you can understand that there is one social class called the babus and they are prominent in the city not necessarily that there are one two four five six families no not at all there was a class of people who were there now uh, my topic will be on marvel palace so let me take you to a historical journey of marvel palace i hope everyone is aware about jora shanko for its thakur bari so within the vicinity of that thakur bari only marvel palace is located in 1835 raja rajendra chandra mollik a wealthy bengali merchant with a passion of collecting works of art began the construction of the marble palace 
it was completed on 1840 it is a very private property still now of the mallik family the mallik family of chorbagan was founded by ramkrishna mallik who made his fortune in business raja rajendra mallik was adopted son of nilmani mallik who built a jagannath temple which predates marble palace and still stands within the premises but it is only accessible to the members of the family as the age of 3 nilmani died leaving behind rajendra to inherit all his wealth i hope some of you have might have visited jaipur and you have visited the city palace the part of the city palace is open for public where the tourists can go and the rest part is still under the royal kingdom of jaipur so a part is there where tourists can go but in not all parts so this is one such part of the jagannath temple of the thakur dalan where no one is allowed if you are not a family member of the mallik family you are not allowed rajendra mallik or raja rajendra mallik the contemporary of prince dwarkanath tagore has built this palatial mansion in 1835 by a french architect it would be later named as marble palace by lord minto the house was designed in neoclassical style while the plan with its open courtyards is largely traditional bengali actually in a bengali house in a traditional bengali house we get a dalan or a uthon like thing so it actually represents that adjacent to that courtyard there is a thakur dalan or a place of worship for members of this family even in traditional bengali family you will also get a thakur dalan just by the side of the courtyard the three story building has tall corinthian pillars ornamented verandas with street walk and sloping roofs built in the style of a chinese pavilion so it's a mix of so many cultures the premise also include a garden with lawns a rock garden a lake and a small zoo this small zoo is very very popular people visit the small zoo when they go to have a look of the marble palace now how you will go to marble palace marble palace is not open for public you have to approach the tourism department or the ministry of tourism where they will judge your enthusiasm why you are visiting the marble palace so if they are satisfied with your motivation for travel or motivation to visit they will offer you a visiting pass by showing the visiting pass that visiting pass will have a particular date and time by showing the visiting pass you can enter the palace and also to the museum but not all part of it some is still restricted once tourists pass through the gate and step into the compound of the malliks they may think that they have stepped into a different era actually it is a different era it, it feels it smells like that a white marble colossal structure stands secluded in a dingy lane of north kolkata the lane is very very narrow uh, mostly encroached by the local businessmen but still uh, you have to pass through it announcing the stark contrast with the world in its periphery the marble palace is one of the finest example of european architecture with an indian touch and an eye opener in the 19th century grandiosity yes it is one of the finest european architecture i will actually keep marble palace second after victoria memorial hall so let's go through the museum once more approachable to the dingy north kolkata lane and perhaps not too well known because entry is restricted yes it is not open for public so that is one such reason why this marble palace is not very known to the common people even let us make a survey on the people living in south kolkata let us take 
10 15 students and ask them do you know where marble palace the answer will be negative okay so uh, it is known for its marble flooring and marble decor wall panels beautiful decorative wall panels it houses 76 rare artworks brought in 1830 all the way from italy and belgium the palace is divided into five halls reception halls painting room sculpture room billiard rooms thakur dalan so it's a mix of european and indian the palace takes one to the victorian era with its beautiful decor and eye-catching collections the museum has sculptures from Praxiteles to Phidias, Venus to Apollo, Homer to Diana, and Moses. There is also an enormous Japanese bronze vase in the doorway that immediately catches one's attention. Sir, sorry to disturb you again. Your yes, slide is uh, still static. Then it's not moving. Okay, in which slide am I out now? Which slide you are seeing? Uh, perhaps it is uh, uh, 15 or 16. Yeah, I, I am in 15, slide number 15 only. But just before it, you were in 3 or 4. Just it is now changed. Okay, I think that the problem is when I am full screening this, the problem is there. So can I keep it like this? Yes, please. Okay. So uh, there is a dimly lit room dedicated to paintings belonging to the Victorian age, like the Marine View by Dutch painter Jan van Goyen, Madonna with Child by Italian painter Glovani, Batista, Salvida, Sassoferato, the mystic marriage of St. Catherine by Rubens and the martyrdom of St. Sebastian by Piero del Polaido, as also some paintings by famous Indian artist Raja Ravi Varma. The Marble Palace also has what is perhaps the first Indian private zoo which is open to visitors. So let us talk about some conservation issues. Conserving the heritage for the future generation for the sake of tourism is a major concern for tourism planners. The tourism planners they are working day and night to find out newer and newer avenues for the conservation and the preservation of the heritage throughout the country. So Marvel Palace is also not an exception. There are certain issues relating to the conservation part. The total area of Marvel Palace is around 26 bigas or 65,000 square meters. It itself is a wonder as it contains huge collection of priceless artifacts. Not only this, there are few items which is rare in the world. Presently, there are employee strength of Marvel Palace is around 150 numbers, out of which 50 of them are zoo and garden maintenance staff. 32 of them are working in domestic and maintenance field. Rest are caretakers called Darwan who look after the security and the implementation of the rules. We have to understand a 26 bigha house really need a force of security personnel for guarding its very precious things. But the fact is, as for the collections and all over the maintenance, must be improved more than today. Well, what is there? It should be improved. It should be the state of art maintenance and preservation. There are a need in the staff, expert staff or guides to take their responsibility so that they can provide good service to tourists because a tourist visiting Marble Palace without the core concept of what this palace is all about, 
what are the things in it it will be useless to visit because museum visit we call is one of the toughest visits because you should be a knowledgeable person to visit a museum and if with that knowledge museums actually play a major role in education it plays a major role in social development so until and unless we are aware about what the things are in this museum we cannot manage so what i do think that yes there is a need of expert staffs or guides who can provide best service i am coming back to the service portion again better and effective conservation of the arts and artifacts are the need of the day scientific conservation and preservation of the museum objects need special attention from the tourism perspective proper promotion of the museums to the foreign tourists need to be done mostly in kolkata what uh, being a tourism professional we find that lot of britishers they come to kolkata in search of their roots okay they are great grandfather their parents they might be buried in the park street cemetery so they come to pay homage so we should tap this sort of people and make them aware that there is one such place in kolkata a palace itself which is a combination of european and indian architecture so it is a must visit we must make it a must visit but uh, how can we encourage visits in such type of palaces in south india and even in uh, rajasthan i have seen they use the light and sound show depicting the history so people purchasing ticket going into the light and sound show enjoying the event understanding what the thing is all about and they are really filled with knowledge and after that a trained guide tour to the museum is the best for the tourists it should be planned accordingly time specifically it should be planned this will generate more revenue to be used for the conservation purpose as we all know that conservation is a very very difficult thing it it is a costly affair and in most of the cases the family members even the government they sometimes fail to manage it so until and unless a part of the revenue is drawn from the tourists this cannot be made in proper although marvel palace is in the tourist map of kolkata but a special package with audio visual tour need to be implemented that means you are entering into a gallery and there is a audio jack you will get this headphone on hire from the main door of the entry take the headphone go to the place put the jack in the jack holder listen what they are saying listen to the video watch the video listen to the people uh, listen to the recorded audio you will come to know about what the thing is all about so the audio visual package is a very very popular package in uh, north india and even in south indian palaces the staffs of the palace need to be trained for museum conservation and they need some supervision for the external agencies like archaeological survey of india they can help even asiatic society can help the buildings and the garden need special attention for the conservation purpose so uh, in that uh, 26 bigha there is a huge part which is having a beautiful garden a small zoo so they also need to be taken proper care of so in short marvel palace is one it could it has got the capacity to become one of the best place of visit in kolkata although it is in the tourist map but still it requires special attention because entry is restricted we have to understand that the family reside there 
so whatever tourism activity that need to be taken up it should not disturb them so it should be a limited tourist movement with a lot of restrictions tourists should be educated enough to enter into the palace then only we can somehow manage and balance tourism and palace visit now in the next slide i am going to show you some glimpses of the marriage uh, marble palace just look at the picture looking at the picture you will feel that oh i must visit this place so that is marble palace from one end the first picture top left top right is the thakur dalan so we are talking about this the top right section the thakur dalan which is unique no other palace have this and this is the corridor the corridor that mentions that depicts history the history of the babus of bengal right so it is a well decorated corridor and a corridor that actually reflects the european culture and the extreme right bottom picture is the dance room or the nach ghar so the bengali babus they used to have dance they are very fond of dance and music so they used to hire dancers and dancers they used to hire ustads of music and a special performance used to happen in this nach ghars now let us conclude this because i am running short of time so in conclusion what i can say is that if proper measures and marketing strategies are taken for making marble palace an iconic destination for showcasing the babu culture it can create a pulse among the city lovers and the tourist visiting the city yes because the tourists who are visiting the city they are not aware about the babu culture whatever they are reading they are reading the recent stories they are reading the recent news about kolkata so do you expect a tourist going back 500 years 300 years back to study about the city most of the case it will be no but if somehow we with the help of our marketing tools with our marketing strategies if somehow we can manage to bring them here showcase the culture definitely it will create a pulse among the city lovers at the tourist you have to understand one thing that the more destinations to visit in kolkata city means more footfall of the tourist and the average length of stay of the tourist will increase that will definitely contribute to the positive economic generation from the tourism perspective the descendants uh the palace have all the important inputs of becoming a destination for all definitely one need to visit first to understand what this is the descendants of the malik family need to work together with the west bengal tourism and other stakeholders to make it more acceptable to the tourists and serving the role of a museum addressing the babu culture of the city where once alive which was once alive during the british rule thank you very much audience for a patient hearing of my lecture thank you so much i am open for any questions that you have okay let us see if we have any question or not yeah sure let us see actually uh, we can announce if there is any question uh, please put it in the comment box and i think uh, we should move to the second uh, topic yes we can move to the second topic i i am very thankful to dr shankar mukherjee for Thank his you, valuable insight into the history of Marble Palace of Kolkata 
he had vividly described the each and every corner of the palace and i think it will encourage tourists in near future to visit this place whenever they come to calcutta thank you sir thank you now thank you so much. i would like to invite dr shati bishash shati bishash is presently faculty member in the department of islamic history and culture university of kolkata she was also associated with various colleges in the city of kolkata and apart from the department of islamic history and culture she is also associated with the women's studies department she have been awarded both charles wallace and nehru trust for visiting europe and royal asiatic society of london she has pursued her phd on early mughal painting from kala bhavan shantiniketan and presently she is also associated with various art organizations today her topic is medieval gold in the light of contemporary travelers and today's scope as a tourist hub now it's over to you dr bishash thank you onkon for that kind introduction though that big introduction wasn't really uh, necessary it was just enough to say that i'm just a faculty member uh i honestly thank the department of tourism and travel ramkrishna mission vidya mandir uh to given me this chance and also shiva bharati mahavidyalay department of history for giving me this chance uh to present my paper uh in this international seminar now before uh giving my topic to the organizers i was really wondering as to what would be my uh, contribution to this uh, seminar and uh, what will be my uh, role as a presenter so i grossly present myself here as a traveler and also as a researcher of medieval history so for me this connecting history heritage culture and tourism way to an inclusive growth i pick up the strands of inclusivity inclusivity and i pick up the strand of heritage and culture now my aim would be to look into a, a particular site and through that canvas i would like to present myself as a traveler who will be demanding certain uh, position or demanding certain things from the tourism management and also from the tourism fraternity management fraternity now my title is medieval gore in the light of contemporary travelers and today's scope as a tourist hub it sounds uh, definitely very simple but here i'm not to cascade gore as an architectural brilliance its architectural brilliance because i'm not a student of or i'm not a researcher who does architecture medieval architecture i will also not uh, going to talk about uh, how the medieval travelers described only uh, gore rather what i'm going to do is i'm going to take the strands of their uh, travel accounts and i'm going to get into a little more complex concept of mindscape medieval mindscape that is what i'm going to do i'm going to see through their travel accounts the mindscape of the colonial rule and how that has designed the tourism uh, the idea of which which still you know we are carrying over uh, into our tourism spots tourism sites and why that is so necessary to be removed so that is exactly what i'm going to do i'm going to i'm going to talk about medieval mindscape and i'm going to talk about gore and gore's gore associated with gore the medieval mindscape now what exactly do i mean by mindscape if i take it by its dictionary term uh 
it is a mental or psychological scene or area of the imagination. So when I say medieval mindscape, I essentially mean a medi an idea about medieval, which is more psychological and which is also a part of imagination. But imagination has, and, uh, and uh, imagination has a lot to do with tourism. Because when we go to a place, we try to we try to gel it with our imagination. Either we have heard something about it, or maybe what we imagined before coming to that place. So there is always a preconceived notion about a tourist place. And there is also a preconceived notion about a historical place. Now, this is where I want to really harp. When I say a historical place, it is as though the time and space has stopped there. Now, any place, when you visit there, has an economy, an economy which has a past, an economy which is continuous an economy which connects to the past and will have a future. So, Gore definitely has a present, has a past, and also has a future. So, we have to look into that prism. Now, it is from here at the end where I'm going to talk about tourism management, which is, of course, not my foray. As I've told you, I will be demanding certain things from the tourism management. Now, <clears throat> there is a personal connection with, or rather a personal association with uh, Gore. Before I start, I will say that uh, this is a place where uh, West Bengal Archaeological Department and uh, universities are uh, Islamic History and Culture, Department of Islamic History and Culture, uh, they uh, started a project of looking into the history of Gore. Of course, they did not do extensive archaeological excavation, but a more of an overview and evaluation that was done by both my teachers, uh, Professor Anurudh Dhurai uh, and Professor Ratnabuli Chatterjee and Professor Kamaruddin sir was there, and along with uh, from the archaeological survey, there was uh, 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 Pratip Kumar Mitra, who was actually the person who was looking into it from their uh, point of great scholar himself. And one of my colleagues, uh, who was a research scholar there, one of my senior colleagues today, Shutapa Sinha. And it is because of her, perhaps, we many a times we visited Gore. Uh, so gore for me was certain hearsay certain stories certain imagination and me as a as a bengali you know as a bangali it was uh, i was my, the pride you know an imagination of pride and being a medieval student it was my imagination that i had so my first entry into that city in, in, into malda and moving into the medieval site was very interesting. Uh, it was, it was, um, it was. I, I was very excited to look into it. So, for me, a historical site which has certain tourist uh, attraction, it goes beyond time and space. As a medieval student. I am interested in a medieval site. Somebody else will be interested in the site with a different mindscape. Somebody with, so there is preconceived notion that his politics in it. There is sociocultural background into that mind space. So everything has gone into this understanding. So before I move on from here, I would like to bring your attention first to the first person who, pop, on, a, on a scale, popularized uh, 
uh, popularized goal in the 19th century, in the early 19th century, and that was Henry Creighton. Now, Henry Creighton, now here also, again, when I say Henry Creighton, and yes, of course, he was a British subject. I mean, he was a, he was a Britisher. He was, he was far from Britain. He was this white man. But he was from Scotland. And he was an indigo planter, not even an indigo plant. He was not working in a factory. He was there as uh, he was. He was serving uh, Charles Grant, his master. So he was play. Uh, their their factory was in a place called Guamalpi, which is and the and and the remnants of their factory is still found there. Of course, that is not a tourist site. So this is one lacuna. So. Uh, Charles Grant, uh, after a, a point in 1786, uh, he was, Creighton was appointed by Charles Grant uh, as a manager in his uh, indigo factory. Uh, and uh, because of his family reasons, Grant uh, had to return to England, back to England, and Creighton took in charge. Creighton was initially very, very uh, disgusted with the place, but you know, he was a painter. So his favorite pastime was to paint. And he started moving into the ruins of medieval gore. Then he started, he took a serious interest in the ruins and antiquities. And uh, he started drawing them. And then he did another thing. Now, you see, he was an amateurist. He started collecting inscriptions. Collect started collecting antiquities that were there. It was just interest, just interest. He was, remember, an indigo planter. He was no one else. He was working in that factory. But then these inscriptions and antiquities moved, was removed from here by William Franklin, Regnal Porch, and other British officers. And for the first time, regional antiquities started moving into British and American Museum or, or, or to the West. Now, these were not read well. These were not understood well. They were not associated with the history of the place. They were just taken away because they were antiquities. Now, after Creighton died, all his drawings were made into a book, The Ruins of Gore described and represented in 18 views with the topographical map. This is a very important and an interesting map that was done by Creighton. Now, this was all again done to support his family because his death was very untimely, so it was done. And in the introduction of this book, Creighton describes the topography of the ruins and the state of their preservation. And he also mentions two persons. Reuben Burrow and James Rennell. These are the two people who has been mentioned. So, gold was this curious space into which the Britishers were taking interest. Now, how was they taking interest? Both Burrow and Rennell were amateurists. They were not very serious with what they were doing. Creighton had a great love for that place. He was, uh, he was an avowed uh, uh, church person. But, and he, it is said that it, it is also there uh, in, in the records that he set up some vernacular schools. See, an indigo planter starting a vernacular school, that is very interesting. So we must understand that Creighton was not the British official. He was a person who fell in love with the place. A person from Scotland coming to this place, getting associated with the, with the place, fell in love with the place and wanted to have and so had some kind of cultural assimilation with the place, maybe from a higher end, from a hierarchical position. He had that. So he he was he was this evangelical Christian belief and zeal uh, associated with personal love. And we will come back to him often uh, while I'm doing this. So it is this person we have to hold tight. 
for him, medieval travelers did not have any, he, they, he was not overburdened by the medieval travelers because he did not know them. He did not know them. He did not know Manrik. He did not know uh, Ralph Pitch. Neither he need, knew about the Chinese travelers of, of the heydays of uh, gold in the 15th and the 16th century. Now, here I want to again come into another point. Now, when I say gold, the ruins of gold, I'm talking about a history which, which stretches from 15, uh, 1450 to 1565, a mere 115 years. But gold was not 115 years. Gold was more than that. Gold was a concept. Gold was a concept where the Bengali mind, the Bengali culture developed. You go to Bangor, from, which is far away from what the medieval site was, and extends to the next Mughal capital also. This whole area was the economic space. Travelers were moving. Traders were moving. Officials were moving throughout the period of where you can record history. So it is much larger an area as a concept. So for a tourism, for a tourist, you have to take into consideration this whole area because you're moving into a space which can go beyond your time and space that of your imagination. Now, here I come to come to 1861. In 1861, Alexander Cunningham, under his leadership, we have the Archaeological Survey of India. Now, this was a blessing as well as a curse on Indian history. Now, people are always very shocked to hear that, but it is true. Because the Archaeological Survey was actually the mind of the Britishers. It reflected their policy. And their policy had a way of looking on to our past. We have to understand that they took over from us. What they took over from will not be appreciated by them. To keep us in good mood, they will take us to, to they will take us to our ancient period and say that that was good. What we took over from was not good for you. So there was a politics in the policy. There was a politics in the education system. There was a politics in the archaeological survey. There was politics in every British subject. They wanted to inject us with that policy. They want to divide us because they wanted to rule. So when we say, when we talk about archaeological survey and its contribution, we also have to be very, very cautious at what is the reason we are doing it. So what we find from the first day of 1861, that there is a distinct hierarchy of knowledge. Now, where they divided into India into ancient and medieval. They wanted to put them both in watertight compartments. They did not want to see it as a continuity of culture. So for a person who is planning a place as a tourist spot, the management person has to look into this continuity. This continuity has to be looked into. So the case of medieval site of Gore in Bengal provides an example of how indigenous intervention was able to structure a domain of counter authority around the monuments still under the custody of the colonial archaeologists. So Gore is a finest example of Bengali culture, not only developing in the medieval period, but also a culture, a Bengali regional identity, which was very much in taking into, taking the center stage in the 19th century. 
And here, the medieval travelers played a very important role because medieval travelers was used by the British in one way and medieval travelers was being used by us even today in a certain way. So this is, this is what I understand by medieval mind, setting up a medieval mindscape. Now, uh, so gore as a site, even for an archaeologist, was never lost. It is a site of continuity. Any site, most of the sites, are sites of continuity, excepting few. If, if some space has been, uh, has been lost because of some uh, environmental reasons, that's different. But a place like gore, is a place where we have continuity. So the Portuguese, Portuguese visitors to, to, to the European painters, to the collective memory, the oral history, to the indigenous sources, everywhere gold was in some amount of imaginations in people's mind. So we talk, we, we get to now from here, move a little back. Let's take 1643. Sebastian Manrik visits Gore. And what does he see? He sees Shah Shuja digging Gore for treasures. Now, if I say 1565, Gore as a capital came to an end, moved to Tanda, and for a brief period came back, but of course moved away. So it's, it ended by 1565 officially. What was Shah Shuja doing in 1643? He was digging the ruins. Now, he was digging the ruins because he had certain information about, about Gore's treasures, Gore's wealth, because that was in the popular mind. So Shah Shuja, when he was digging, because he wanted, he had to have that money for practicidal battle that he is going to fight uh, with his brothers, and going to somehow control Shah Jahan, uh, he had, as a governor, certain information. And Manrik writes it very well. He, he gives you an idea about that. Even when Ralph Fitch visits Tanda in 1583, which is the second capital of the, of the Mughals, uh, the first capital, of course, from Gore, if you say, he also talks about Gore. He did not visit Gore directly because that was perhaps not important for him. But for him, it was all in the mind, in the oral culture. As far as Mughal presence is concerned, we just have a Lukochuri Dorwaza, Dorja, which looks like a Mughal structure. Of course, perhaps that was built by the Mughals because of, again, trade reasons or because Shah Shuja wanted to enter there. But there is another very interesting note by somebody com called William Hedges. Now, William Hedges visited Gore in the 17th century. And he has a novel picture, 17th century. Remember, mind it, it is in the 17th century. And he talks, he compares Gore to Constantinople. Very curious. As far as records are concerned, Gore was abandoned in 1565 as a capital. But what was what would William Hedges writing about in the 17th century? Because perhaps Gore still had certain things to offer. Now, maybe, you know, Hedges was uh, uh, bringing in a lot of imagination. That can be, that, that can be. But can you imagine anything in the ruins without seeing anything? Even if it is in the ruins, if it is narrated to you, there has to have some amount, there has to have some amount of reality in it, or else it is very difficult to even a person like. Now, I talked about Henry Creighton, the person who was first uh, brought everybody's notice to this place, the Scott indigo planter, his boss, Charles Grant, uh, in 1758, I will, I will note here, 
as uh, in, in, in he uh, of course he managed to uh, supply uh, some material from Gore to the St. John's Church, Kolkata St. John's Church from Gore, uh, which was about some uh, 1,258 rupees, the, the amount of it, uh, the material cost, the material uh, that he uh, tr uh, transferred. So that was also a contribution. Now, these two things, ch what Charles Grant did, and what Shah Shuja did, will you call it vandalism? This is a very, very important question when it comes to medieval uh, site. You can, you can, you can ruin a medieval site with very strong political intentions. You can uh, destroy a site with religious instinct. Uh, instigation you can do it why you do it how they do it what is the mindscape i'm not going into that i'm going into something very shady here shashuja digging gore see shashuja we have to again understand was a, even a foreigner to bengal he has no association with bengal he came to Bengal for money. Bengal was considered always a punishment posting for the Mughals. Well, Shah Shuja came here for money. He needed that. And he knew to find money from Gur. So when he was when he was plundering Gur, was it Mughal vandalism? Well, Someone will say yes. But from a practical point, if you see that a place which is not used in the 17th century can be of some benefit to the person. So this is A. B, when Charles Grant was moving some stuff to the, the, to the church, the St. John's Church, will we consider this again vandalism well i'm not going into this controversy are we then going to equate charles grant and uh Shashuja? this is also something that we should ponder now why am i talking about vandalism why i'm talking about all of this in a seminar of tourism because all these counts because all of this counts because this construct the medieval mindscape. So when you are going to look into a, a medieval site from its tourist management, tourism management uh, concept, we are going to take into consideration all of this also. It is important to do that. Now, a German, <coughs> Joseph Tekhaner, in 1784, uh, he again talks about uh, Gore being absolutely in a dilapidated condition. It's jungle. Uh, there's nothing in it. Well, the German did not go there. But of course, there was, you see, it's a tropical area. So it's a tropical area. There's going to be rain. There's going to be jungles if it is not used. But for them, you know, oral history plays a very important role. All of these people were, uh, were very aware of the previous European travelers about Manrik. They were, or they were also aware of Ralph for that matter. Because whenever anybody from Europe came, they were very thorough with what was written about this place by the Europeans. But nobody was taking into consideration the Chinese accounts, which came later, much later much later into the foray of our knowledge. Now, it was this time when Creighton was drawing the map of Gore, you have people like Daniel and Hodges who were trying to draw up a neat picture of the colonial setup. Everything again was imagination. 
Now, Daniel's work or Hodge's work, Daniel's work of Oriental Scenery uh, and 24 Views in Hindustan or Hodge's Select Views in India gave a kind of an uh, 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 created an imagination way back into people's mind in Europe, which was backed by the travelers. But Creighton, the Scottish indigo planter here, first laid the foundation stone of research, taking gold into consideration. So in a way, Creighton preceded Ferguson, about whom we're going to talk later, transforming the monuments of gold into an evidence of a lost civilization. This turned the attention of the colonial officials to start conservation work in gold. Now, in this, in this uh, place, of course, we have to talk about James Ferguson, uh, who should be considered a pioneer he was also an indigo planter like Creighton, and he worked between 1835 and 42. And in his writing, what we see is very interesting. This quote I want to read. Bengal is practically without stones or any suitable material for forming either beams or pillars. Having nothing but bricks, it was almost a necessity that they employed arches everywhere. Yes, gold has arched bridges. Gold has arch brick built bridges, which is still used by the uh, by uh, the present, uh, like the present. You know, the trucks which move to Bangladesh through the Kotwali actually go through the five arches, the seven arches of gold, even today. So he was actually, help, act, unknowingly, he was pointing at a very important, uh, important mastery, architectural mastery about, of Bengal. So he says, uh, he says, the Bengalis taking advantage of the elasticity of the bamboo universally employ in their dwellings a curvilinear roof. While to the European eye, this form always remains unpleasing to the native eye, the Hindus or Mohammedans, it is most elegant of modern invention. So they were very clear. They were all gaga about the stone structures of Delhi and Agra. They did not understand why brick was so important to Bengal because we did not have stones. We use the technique of brick built structures. We, in collaboration with China, and later we did with ourselves, we had the glazed bricks, the glazed bricks. We had a close connection with Langhuan in China. So anybody who wants to get into the tourism management has now also to cascade this, this aspect, the technology that the medieval had, which was very different from Delhi, very different. It was our regional identity. Now, this remarks of Ferguson and, of course, Cunningham uh, built the, uh, the European mind. Now, Cunningham was all obsessed with hue and sun which route he came where he went what what was mentioned and everything where the regional identity was shunned in the periphery so along with this in the 1880s you have the special department of curatorship for ancient monuments and here also we see this hierarchy you know, the ancient monuments getting more attention compared to the medieval monuments because we cannot, because the British mind will never appreciate anything that is medieval because they took over from there. So, again, a systematic step was perhaps taken in 1873 when the government of India assigned 
to the local government the duty of preserving all monuments of historical architecture and importance. This is one. So the regional uh, governors now were given a task of preserving whatever you have. Thank God to that, because then, you know, Bengal governor will give certain attention to the Bengali structures. Fine. But the real problem created in the 19th century with the education system. Now, what happened in the education system? Education system definitely thrusted to not continuity, but divided India on the lines of ancient, medieval and modern. And exact the line that the Europe followed. But they did fail, or rather they did not fail. They understood it very well. They understood this is the line we are going to follow for the divide. So education was divided. And based on that, every other aspect of the British, uh, the colonial life was divided. So obviously, to ASI, the Bengali monuments compared to Delhi and Agra was not something very to be appreciated. Interestingly, ASI did not look into the town planning of Cove. They did not see how the river was negotiated, how the palace area was guarded, because that was not what they wanted to do. Here comes the nationalists. Uh, researchers. Here we have to talk about Abhidali, Rajani Kanto Chakraborty, and Akhoi Kumar Mohitra. They also started their study with the European travelers account because that was handy to them. But Abhidali, if we have to historically place him, he was he worked as a PWD official during the time of Lord Curzon, who was with the new archaeological policy Lord Curzon made this statement, it is my judgment, equally our duty, so please mind that line, it is my judgment, equally our duty to dig and discover, to classify, reproduce and describe, to copy and decipher, and to cherish and conserve. So it is all their responsibility. But it is their judgment. It is my judgment. So they will do everything. But the judgment is going to be theirs. So here comes Abhidali's interesting work of Memoirs of Gaur and Pandu. Abhidali was an PWD official, true. But he was... Uh, the aristocrat who came from Delhi, whose forefathers came from Delhi, stayed in Bengal and who took great pride in preserving the culture of this place. He was man of the soil. So for him, Gaur and Pandua were, had a different take altogether. So he was somebody who was now taking into consideration the Persian Chronicles. So he was now, now in a position to compare the travelers' accounts, the medieval travelers, a European travelers' account with Persian chroniclers, with European travelers and British archaeologists. So everything now was in place: Persian chronicles, European travelers, and the British archaeologists. So and he and he moved within these ruins because he knew the place. He knew how to move. So clearly for Abid Ali, the lost city had expanded beyond its boundaries to span a lost empire. So he was not ready to limit Gaur only to 1450 to 1565. He wanted to move the culture of Gaur out. So now for the first time, an Indian from an Indian perspective was taking Gore and Gore's cultural space. And he was moving within a space irrespective of time. So this is very important. So uh, it was, of course, uh, his memoir was uh, completed in uh, 1900. And uh, uh, the memoirs of Abid Ali uh, was completed. 
complete in 1902. Uh, of course, he visited uh, and that was presented to Curzon. Now, uh, and it was, of course, then uh, took a very big turn with Stapleton doing a few more rounds of visit there and then completing it and all that was done. Now, here I want to bring in another person, Rajuni Kanto Chakraborty. He was a Sanskrit teacher, a very, very close friend of Abhidali. Somebody who was conversant in Boshnoptics. Now he was digging in from the Boshnop text. So now what we have is Persian Chronicle. We have the British archaeologists looking into the whole thing, uh, archaeological findings. We have the European travelers. And now we have the Bushnop texts. And for the first time, Abhidali and Rajani Kanto looked into the spirit of the heydays of Gore when you have Kadam Rasul and the Ramkeli, which is still there. You know, we're still there. Ramkeli Utshok Akuno Hoy. And Kadam Rasulio, for particular days, you have the festival. Everybody visits there. And it is just few feet away from each other. So Kadam Rasul and Ram Keli stand side by side. That is what is the spirit of gold. And that is what is the spirit of the medieval, uh, medieval Bengal. And that is the spirit, I think, which has to be cascaded when somebody brings in gold into the map of tourism. Now, Recycling of materials for new structures was logically explained by Rajani Kanto. I talked about vandalism. I talked about Shashuja's vandalism. I you intentionally use vandalism. And I said that I'm perplexed whether I'm going to use this term. And also of Charles Grant. But Rajani Kanto here strikes at a very important point. He strikes that Bengal, if you take it to this geography, cannot have architectural facets which are going to last for centuries it is going to face its rain it is going to face its moisture and there is a culture of use and reuse of material so in gore we see use and reuse of material hindu structures being used for the buddhist structures the Buddhist structures being used for the Muslim structures, if you call that Muslim, of course. So ancient medieval, ancient structures is used by the medieval structure. And the medieval dilapidated bricks were brought to the church to be built. So it is very common. Yes, if there is an intentional, intentional way of harming, then that is vandalism. For Shah Shoja, who was from Delhi, he had no connect, as I told you. For him to dig a gore and unearth some treasures, it was very common. In this also, we have to mention somebody called Sayyid Ilahi Baksh. He was the last munshi of that place. Ilahi Baksh looked into more about the inscript, the Persian inscription. Of course, most of it is lost, but of course, we have to. And last, I want to talk about Akhoi Kumar Moitro. For him also, if you read into Moitro's work, he starts with medieval European uh, travelers because that is there in the mindscape, you know, and it works there because all of them are colonial subjects. And in the 19th century, early 19th century, when we have Bongo Bongo, Romitronath and Akhoi Kumar Moitro, they came hand in hand to look into, it was Romitronath's idea uh, to actually build a history, a body of history by the Bengalis and for the Bengalis. And you see the Oitihashik Chitro, the journal coming into its being. And Akhoi Kumar Moitro traveled throughout the area. And because of that, his, he said that history was to be seen as recorded truth. And no departure from facts could be allowed in its narrativization. Early 20th century. 
it was this attitude which led him to write the history of gore of course and came into being uh, his first attempt was gore lekhumala in 1912 and then we have the barindro research society of 1910 which later of course has been now the barindro museum of course so there was this attempt to write our history began this was the first canvas of writing our history and it was of course definitely supported by people you know trained archaeologists right like rakhal dash went so and they covered of course rakhal dash when he was talking about the palos and the senas rakhal dash was very very careful to include medieval period in its last plan in, the, in its conclusion so it was you know where rakhal dash left that akhay kumar maitro took up so it was a continuity that the british failed to see they were just taking the strands one or two so it was the nationalists in a way who were carrying this so then came akhay kumar as a uh, most celebrated essay gorer katha so Dr. Kumar Maitra laid the foundation of the regional history, which had to had the ethno-linguistic identity of the Bengali people built into its core. This is what really bothered Gandhi. This bothered Gandhi. Now, Gandhi, realizing all of this, he jumped into places. like with very sanskrit names rambita patalchundi bollalbari all of this came into cunningham's work now in building his thesis on this scanty evidence he was denying those principles of investigation which he himself considered to be modern and scientific because you see he had a bigger schema or rather he did not have a bigger schema he was part of the bigger schema he had to head the asi asi had to be funded by the british government and it had to it had to it had to support the politics because they had to stay they had to be the masters we had to be the colony so for cunningham bringing out he he just he just interestingly mentioned rambita patalchundi bollalbari but what abidali did along with his friend along with his friend of uh, you know joining uh, both kadam rasul and ramkeli he failed to do that because he did not share the same cultural ethos but also he did not share the spain spirit because of politics so when i say now if i can have explain myself when i say medieval mindset so unearthing uh when you are unearthing gore actually you're not unearthing a single gore you are actually unearthing many 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 more gores you are actually looking into it so this is my humble kind of a request to all all the uh, tourism management people that when you want to include historians when you want to include history research when you want to include uh, let's say people from uh, cultural history history of heritage that is the that is how you can become you can take into consideration the inclusive culture if you cannot take into consideration the inclusive culture what you do is you know you cannot harp on continuity if you don't harp on continuity you don't harp on continuity tourism management fails now on a lighter note i want to end that when someone goes to gore well you just don't go with your uh, pricey camera take the pictures of the uh, uh, lotton masjid or adina mosque uh, and uh, then you come back 
No. You also go to see the ambagan, the orchards. You go to the market. You also buy amshatu, which is a very big industry out there. But at my last note, I will I will be sharing a very personal memory. This is of a Kotwali darwaza. Two stories. One of our historian, one of my teachers, while he was um, uh, researching there, was so taken away, uh, taken aback by Kotwali darwaza that he started moving through Kotwali darwaza. When he moved through Kotwali darwaza, then the BSF came into thing. They said, "You have to go back because this is Bangladesh border." You're moving actually into the land of Bangladesh. So that was very painful, you know, when Anirudh Rai came to us and said, of course, many years later, he said, Deshati, as a person who was born before 1947, that was the most painful thing for a historian like me, that I cannot cross Kotwali Darwaza because that is a land of the other. So othering has to be stopped. This is one. The second thing was, in that Kotwali Darwaza, when I was talking to my colleague and her experiences out there with the chai, I was sitting in front of a truck driver uh, from Ludhiana. He was stranded there for two days and they are very, very, uh, they are used to this. You know, when there is an Indo-Bangladesh problem, all the trucks, trans, and they, you know, they have a little bit of a picnic. There's anxiety also. And he started communicating to me in, in, in Bangla. Didi muni kotha the question? Kolkata? Somebody, a truck driver from Ludhiana. And I said, how did you pick up so uh, good Bangla? He said, I hamate jate hai. So he keeps on coming and going from the Kotwali Darwaza, gets stranded in the Bengal border. And a truck driver shares. And he was giving me I'm, and we said that, do you go off and visit the places? He said, of course. I know better gold than you do. I said, yes, of course, you know better gold than you do. Because you came from Ludhiana and stranded in the Kotwali Darwaza, use converse in Bangla. So I end my lecture there with uh, my humble request to people from tourism management that when you include, when you are looking into your management space, please have this... Um, at least this openness to include uh, a historical place beyond its time and space. Thank you. And I will be inviting, I will be, I'll be very happy if I have questions to answer. Thank you. Thank you, madam, for taking us through such a long journey of gold through different ages, through the eyes of different people by following the footsteps of travelers from medieval to modern to ancient. And it was a long journey. We have one comment and one question. One comment is that some Obhijit Goswami, I was eagerly waiting for this moment. You rightly mentioned the reference of Akhay Kumar Maitro. I am as his lineage feeling proud of the facts. I'm also and very happy that you heard my lecture, sir. Thank you so much. And another question from someone, Manov Mondol. He is a bit curious to know that what is the authenticity of William Hedges' diary regarding the history of gold? You see, there is a lot of controversy about William Hedges' diary. Well, I am not a person of the 19th century history, not I am someone who looks into the history of gold either. Now, the reason I'm telling you about, the reason I mentioned William Hedges, and I, if you can remember, that I'm talking about William Hedges because uh, there may not be any historical, uh, historical data to it, reason to it, whatever. But what I'm talking about is memory. That is what I was saying, you know oral histories he heard something he perhaps imagined something this is how i create medieval uh, mindscape that is the first thing which i said you know because history uh tourism uh places all of this is something kind of also which remains in your imagination you know uh in, you imagine something you imagine your past what you have heard you imagine 
suppose when you go to go visit a place leave apart historical place any place you hear something you expect something so when you are expecting something when you are hearing something aren't you imagining so that is what i actually wanted to uh, you know uh, ponder on when I, i said that there is definitely no history may not be any history to his diary i mentioned that of course but of course i thank you for this question thank you okay thank you madam thank you very much for the speech now we will move on to the next speaker our next speaker is shamrat goshan he is a young scholar and presently he is an assistant professor in the department of rural studies tripura university but what i must say before that is he is also an alumni of department of economics ramakrishna mission vidyamandir belur he pursued his phd from kollani university on water resource management in rural bengal now he is also interested in various themes of macro and microeconomics and is continuously working on this field now it's over to you sir shamrat goshan he will speak on the topic community tourism as an avenue towards inclusive development for india it's over to you sir thank you so much sir it is really nice to uh, hear from sir uh, i am not a student of history uh, but i will i, I feel i am keen to know about history nowadays and moreover as a student of economics i would like to look into the matter of tourism tourism management from a different angle my part of deliberation is not exactly a kind of lecture that i have planned initially to do but rather a set of questions that actually haunted me to think about the uh, kind of tourism tourism management and how tourism management can be beneficial for the people who are marginalized in nature that's that's how the tourism and the inclusive development that comes together like we so we all know that tourism is the, the most important industry that we have around the world and as the population increased people started to move around started to enjoy the kind of like historical monuments historical places places of beauty like the uh, kind of that mountains and many other places jungles and all these things but it was through certain avenue and that avenue was through the tourism sector now apart from the tourism sector the people who were really living in those places in the villages in the remote areas in the kind of in the surroundings of the jungles etc they were not getting any kind of benefit exactly the way the people who were engaged in this industry are getting now if we follow the so the, the human rights or even the fundamental rights that we are having in crossing the constitution we, we can see that each and every individual human being has different rights in article 14 to article 18 of those areas now looking into that matter the people who are actually staying in the areas that people need to visit the tourists need to visit stay and enjoy their time spend their time but these the money they spend that generally do not stay there now consider that from the angle of the community culture the, the development of 
base religion actually gave it to the gave it to the action. And 1965 onwards, when the places were almost exhausted, people were searching for the aliens. He always said that I was always search for the aliens. Then gradually this concept has come into the picture that if the tourism increases, that creates a pressure on it. And once the pressure on environment increases, then definitely a kind of environmental degradation takes place. Now, once an environmental degradation takes place, I, I personally have uh, had an experience of visiting Himachal Pradesh, the, the, basic, the, the most prominent areas of Himachal Pradesh, like Shimla, Manali, particularly, the Lousy, Rice, and uh, within a span of let's say 10 to 11 years. I have seen how this so-called uh, concretized development, how the places actually changes, how the city actually washes out from the entire, entire area, and how the people who were there, living there, they were gradually So, this is not only, I have just given an example. This is happening everywhere, particularly in the developing countries. And that's how the vision and the importance of this country It not only takes talks about, you know, capturing the marginalized people and providing them some kind of empowerment, providing them some kind of ways of earning their livelihood or maybe kind of a better way for their families. But it talks also about preserving nature. Now why I'm talking about nature? I think we'll talk about the historical monument. I am talking about the nature because since our the civilization started we know that this, this nature has created a human. And through the, the knowledge, through the passage of time, we have really more and more knowledge. They have created some kind of a cultural habit. And then that habit over generations have created a culture. Now, over time, as the culture has been created, that culture has become a part and parcel of life of you know, human civilization. And you will see different parts of the country are going to experience different types of country. Once we are talking about tourism, particularly community based tourism, we are actually looking into that culture, cultural part. You have a lot of examples in cities also, particularly the northern part of the city and the western part of the city. There are very small villages in the northeastern part of India, I think, particularly go. Uh, in the, in the long Karai Valley, actually, we have places which are of enormous civic beauty. The people who are staying there, the indigenous people, they used to carry on the culture of preserving the environment, the nature, for maybe last 100 years. So, that way, these culture-based reasons can be, they can be highlighted through the schemes and projects with tying up with the tourism department in each of the states and all. Then we could have a very good opportunity of capturing those people who are the, the real then that is a very good way of managing the environment on one hand and extending the tourism on the other. Now, in this scenario, as we think about the intrusive development scenario, we will always try to look into the matter 
from the from the point of view of ecological history. Ecological history is what I want to say. Like the, the way the nature was hundred years back, whether the people, whether the indigenous people, the This is where we, we, I think we have to actually see that the tourism management weather, the tourism management takes care only about the tourist sports and how the tourist sports will be managed, how the generations will be taken care of, or we can add these areas also, those people, or those people also. Generally, are marginalized and are deprived in terms of their things. I think we, I, I, I was just trying to ask this question to get to my and I just use this platform to just use this platform to the uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask me. I have a very, very short kind of presentation or kind of uh, speech due to some emergency reasons. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for connecting with us. We know that you are going through a very hard time. For the sake of the audience, we must say that he is just traveling to airport to come to Kolkata. His mother has admitted in ICU and he, she is very serious. So in this tough time, he was with us. This is really, we must appreciate this, that somehow he has managed to be with us and has helped us in making the seminar a grand success. Now, I must say to Sri Mukhopadhyay, if you want to say something, then please, it's over to Sri Gautam Mukhopadhyay. Yeah, uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, there is a question from one of our viewers. I think we just overlooked it, and uh, it is uh, very difficult for us to put it in front of Professor Samarad Goswami. Goswami, I don't know whether it is it possible or not. Uh, yeah, please, please. No problem. Okay, okay. Uh, he's asking that uh, how can we develop West Bengal rural tourism and scope with challenges in development? It's a very fast question, I think. Uh, yeah. That you can address it. Yeah, actually, see, uh, there are a lot of scopes uh, in, I mean, I am, as I am in the Department of Rural Development and Rural Studies, uh, we have different ways of developing our rural regions by empowering people. Now, how to empower people? We have to look into the uh, issues where there is a kind of a core competence. Okay, I mean, maybe some regions where uh, civic duty is important, people can go for developing civic duty or related tourism. Maybe in some areas where uh, temples are important, then there can be a kind of a religious tourism. Maybe in some places where, you know, uh, the, 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 even we can, we can do in that way, like uh, the handicrafts, the, the places where the handicrafts are important, you can, do, you can go for, look for, that kind of tourism. I can I can remember a village uh, when we used to come from Puri to Bhubaneswar. There was a village I forget. I'm just uh, not remembering the name of that particular village. That village is actually important and rather famous 
for uh, kind of a photo chitro okay uh, not exactly the sculpture but paintings now people used to visit that particular place that particular village only for uh, uh, enjoying the painting and sometimes uh, you you have an opportunity to buy for that buy uh, any any of them okay so it's not a kind of a, uh, a free for all kind of a general solution we have to find out that which are the core competent areas we have to identify that and then after identifying that we have to work on that okay, so the tourism management can look into that matter where the people who are really working for that working in that particular sector they can get the benefit okay so that is possible that is also possible uh, am i is it is it okay 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 thank, thank you. you thank you okay 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 and uh, actually we can take the opportunity if it is possible to publish a volume then we can ask the professor goshami to send his article uh, send his lecture in an article form and it would be better if we can incorporate that article in our expected uh, publication uh, so uh, uh, i yeah, think that, that uh, is there is no question no more question so thank you thank you professor shamrat goshami for being with us thank you so in this situation and it is highly appreciable as my co colleague professor ankur purakai has already said thank you thank, thank you thank you, thank you, thank you so, much. so much thank you so much so uh, i would like to offer uh, professor ankur purakai okay thank you all for giving a patient hearing to all of us i also thank all the speakers who are today with us and also the participants and i request you all to join with us tomorrow with our second technical session or second academic session tomorrow at 12:30 pm on this very same place on this very same channel thank you all thank you